So anyway, let us start with the, the Belt and Road Initiative. This is the biggest geopolitical initiative of the 21st century and UPSC has never asked a question in the mains examination about the One Belt One Road project. So there is a big probability that this year is the year of the Belt and Road Initiative. There has been a lot of such news about the Belt and Road Initiatives. Initiative. <coughs> Mainly the Belt and Road Initiative basically it has two parts. It is a massive economic initiative of the Chinese President Xi Jinping and uh, it has two parts. There is a land route and there is a sea route. The land route is called Silk Road Economic Belt or an economic belt. In the economic belt you will be having road, rail routes, oil and natural gas pipelines. Which will be, it will be starting from Xi'an. So remember the city Xi'an. They can ask about Xi'an in, a, in the prelims examination. So the land part of the One Belt One Road project, it starts from Xi'an, a city in central China. From there it will be going to through central Asia, through countries like Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, etc. From there it will be going to Europe, to countries like Russia, the Netherlands, etc. Then it has a silk maritime silk road also there is a land route as well as there is a sea route so there is a maritime silk road which is a network of planned port and other coastal infrastructure so you will be having ports and other coastal infrastructures and it will be mainly it will be starting from southeast asia then it will be going to south asia then to eastern africa mediterranean etc so this is how the maritime silk route works you can see a map here of the silk route so in the past there was something called a silk route. So Chinese President Xi Jinping wants to revive the silk route and that is what the One Belt One Road project is all about. And it was earlier it used to be called as One Belt One Road but now they are calling it the Belt and Road Initiative. Anyway this is all about the Belt and Road Initiative is all about the Chinese dream which President Xi has been trying to capitalize. Xi Jinping when he became a core leader of China onwards he has always been trying to push the idea of a Chinese dream, the idea of a resurgent China which is the number one superpower in the world and all. And that is what the Belt and Road Initiative is all about. The Belt and Road Initiative is expected to be completed by 2014 and which will mark the 100th anniversary of People's Republic of China and at 2014 and China should be the number one economic as well as military power in the globe. That is what the Chinese dream is all about. To make China a developed country like the European nations and to make China the number one military as well as economic power in the world. Realizing the great renewal of the Chinese nation is the greatest dream for the Chinese nation in modern history. See Chinese during their past and all they have this concept of China. See Chinese never called China as China. They, the term they used to refer to China is called the Middle Kingdom. The Chinese sort of believes that China is the middle of the world and everything else is like uh, there is uh, everything else is surrounding China that is the concept of Chinese and Chinese believed that China is the number one country in the world and due to the exploitation of the western imperialists that is the only reason China is not the number one country so the people's republic of China it wants to project to the Chinese people that we will bring that we will bring back the middle kingdom we will bring back a resurgent superpower China And this is said to be Chinese Marshall Plan. Have you heard about Marshall Plan? You might have heard about the Marshall Plan in world history. See, after the Second World War, the European nations were completely devastated due to their engagement in that Second World War. So the United States it started a plan called the Marshall Plan. And as part of the Marshall Plan, the United States gave out enormous economic aid to many of the Western nations to countries like West Germany, UK, France, etc. And it helped in the rebuilding of these Western nations or Western European nations. And due to that Marshall Plan, the Western European nations became key allies of US and they became economically indebted or tied to US. So that project was called the Marshall Plan and according to the current dollar value, the Marshall Plan amount comes to around 120 billion dollar. So the United States invested that much huge amount of money in the Western European nations gave out that much huge money to those countries so that they will be in the future they will be tied to the USA. 
So that is how the Marshall Plan run and the US general during that time, Marshall was basically his name and it became the name of the plan also. That is exactly what the Chinese wants to do also. Now the Chinese will be putting a huge amount of money like it comes to around dollar 1.4 trillion which is around 12 times the Marshall Plan money. So they will be putting this huge amount of money, they will be spending this kind of money on infrastructural projects around the world which connects Asia to Africa, Europe, everything. And uh, by doing this they wants to improve the Chinese, like what we say, the Chinese influence around the globe. So the European countries, African countries, everybody will be economically dependent on China. So they will have a vested interest on China's own development. See the western nations often have a vested interest on US development because their economies are tied or back to the US. So if the US goes down, it will be dramatically affecting the western nations also, the western European nations also. So they, China is trying to replicate the same thing by the One Belt One Road project and many of the western countries or western European countries has been suspicious of the One Belt One Road project also. Then again, it's the China again want to counter pivot to Asia. Have you heard about pivot to Asia? So anyway, the US in the past, it mainly used to focus on some areas like Europe, Middle East, etc. But by exploiting this US focus on these areas, China rapidly enhanced its military power and everything on the Asian region. It was improving its economic relations with the Southeast Asian and other East Asian countries. It was increasing your, its power on Asia. So when Barack Obama administration came to power, what Obama did was he launched a policy called pivot to Asia or rebalance to Asia. Now China is dominating the Asia, US needs to rebalance the Asia and that is how pivot to Asia was launched. And the Chinese again was really afraid of pivot to Asia and US has identified India as a major component in the pivot to Asia also. So you, China wanted to counter pivot to Asia and wanted to have a hegemonic tendency on Asia. So that is again another major aim of the One Belt One Road project. We will be discussing in a more detailed manner about pivot to Asia when we discuss about India-US relations. So that is why, that is one reason why US has so much friendly relations with India right now also. It is a part, it is a part of the pivot to Asia strategy also. And the Belt and Road Initiative, it aims to promote movement of goods, service, as well as people across borders. And Belt and Road Initiative, it also was designed to counter the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Then a major component or a part of the Belt and Road Initiative is the China-Pakistan economic corridor which India is vehemently opposed to. The China-Pakistan economic corridor, it's an economic corridor that starts from the western part of China, the territory that we called Xinjiang before. So in Xinjiang there is a city called Kashgar. So this China-Pakistan economic corridor, it will be starting from Kashgar. From there it will be going through the Pakistani occupied Kashmir through a territory called Gilgit Baltistan. From there it will be <coughs> Finally, it will be ending up in the Baluchistan province of Pakistan. There, China has built a port called Godar port. Anyway, this China-Pakistan economic corridor, it is a 3,000 kilometer economic corridor. It starts from western China and it ends in Godar port in Pakistan. And it's a 46 billion Chinese invested project or China will be funding around 46 billion money or it will be putting that much huge amount of money into the CPEC project and it is big, China's biggest overseas investment yet. So there is that factor and so why is China investing this much of a huge money in a terrorism plagued country like Pakistan? It is basically about solving the Malacca dilemma. See what is the problem of China? This is how China normally import its energy resources through the Malacca Strait. Now China can simply take the resources to the Godar port, from, the, from there it can build some energy pipelines and it can build or take its energy resources through Pakistan to western China. And western China or Xinjiang is an underdeveloped region where there is a lot of separatist movement, so they can solve the separatist movements also. So anyway, as part of the CPEC, China is also building a lot of power plants in Pakistan, so it will be providing around 14,000 megawatts of electricity to energy starved Pakistan. 
and China will be getting an access to the Indian Ocean. And another area is that the Godar port as well as the Karakoram, like the Trans Karakoram Tract or the Shaksgam Valley, these regions can access sort of chalk points with respect to India. See what I mean by that statement is, see the Godar port is located very near to the Strait of Hormuz. Again now things have changed, if India and China have any future conflict, China can blockade the Strait of Hormuz and it can prevent any future energy imports to India. Things have changed. So what we did was we again went to Iran, we built a port in Chabahar, which was again very near to Godar. So this is a, basically this is a very big geopolitical chess game between India and China. And another thing the Chinese have often said that why they did it was to counter the activist policy. So activist policy, through the activist policy, India is improving its relations with countries which China considers as its backyard. Countries like ASEAN countries, Japan, etc. Now what China did was, China will be focusing on India's neighborhood. You don't have to come to our neighborhood. We will come to your neighborhood and we will build all the projects. So you will be forced to focus on your neighborhood. That is again a key idea behind the CP China Pakistan economic corridor. And another area is that the Chinese often said was that, see when the US forces quit Afghanistan or when they leave out of Afghanistan, Taliban will be coming back to Afghanistan. Or radical Islamic terrorism will be coming back to Afghanistan and an unstable Afghanistan is not in anybody's interest. So by building a China-Pakistan economic corridor, China can boost employment and economic development in that region. So people will not be resorting to terrorism. So that is what again something that China wants. So China said that we are building this port or we are building this kind of a huge economic corridor in this area so that we can stabilize the Afghanistan-Pakistan region also. So that there will not be much terrorism in that region and the Uyghur Muslim militants in the Xinjiang region in China will not be getting any support from terrorist groups which will be operating in the AFPAC region. And there were even some security, some of the security threats, uh, sorry, some of the security experts have been saying things like India should support CPEC also because CPEC, if CPEC can genuinely improve the economic situation in Pakistan, maybe that might be our biggest counter to terrorism in Pakistan. Pakistan has, is facing such a huge economic crisis, unemployment and other economic woes are very rampant in Pakistan. So maybe if CPEC can solve that issue, that might be instrumental in solving our own security threats also. Then another thing is the Central Asian countries, see, look at the Central Asian countries. They have energy resources, they have oil and natural gas, they have nuclear fuel, everything. But what is their problem? They does not have any sea access. Now see if the Central Asian countries like Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan etc. If they could simply build roads connecting them to Kashgar, they can use this China-Pakistan economic corridor to get access to sea. So most of the Central Asian countries also they want to join the China-Pakistan economic corridor also. Again for Russia also, CPEC can be an access to the Indian Ocean. So there is again a lot of these countries want to join the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Then another problem that India has with the Belt and Road Initiative is the issue of string of pearls. In the last class we discussed in a detail manner about string of pearls. So basically this is a geopolitical strategy by Chinese to strategically sort of encircle India. And as part of that uh, they have made many ports in countries which are lying on the littorals of the Indian Ocean region and again they have defense cooperation agreements with the countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka etc. And these are mainly aimed at India. Again this is a map of the string of pearls. Now recently there was a huge news. In May 2017 it was held in May 14 and 15, 2017, there was a huge summit in which most of the countries which were partners of the Belt and Road Initiative participated and uh, like it was held at Beijing in China. Anyway, India was again invited to the Belt and Road Summit, but India skipped the Belt and Road Summit. So you might get questions like in the mains examination like what will be the strategic implications of the One Belt, One Road project uh, with respect to India. or uh, 
what to what should be our way forward in dealing with the, the belt and road initiative so what can we write as an answer to such kind of questions so one thing we can use is that we can directly quote or we can directly use what the indian diplomats are saying or what is the official statements of the ministry of external affairs the official spokesperson of the ministry of external affairs gobal bagle in may 2017 when the one belt one road summit happened he said that india will not be attending the belt and road forum or one belt one road summit and for that what he said was his statement was that connectivity projects must be pursued in a manner that respects the sovereignty and territorial integrity so we are ready to promote connectivity projects we are ready for economic integration but the problem is that the china pakistan economic corridor it passes through pakistan occupied kashmir which india considers as a territory of india and see the inner meaning in china investing this much money in cpec is basically is that china supports pakistan in the kashmir conflict or in the kashmir issue see that is why they are investing that much money on pakistan occupied kashmir right that is the inner meaning of that then again the string of pearls and other maritime silk road will be again a security threat so we cannot join a project that threatens the territorial integrity and national security that was the official statement of the ministry of external affairs so this is again another thing you can quote in your main answers anyway in the summit leaders of or the head of state or head of governments of around 29 nations participated in that summit including leaders of pakistan sri lanka and maldives high level delegations and other foreign ministers and other leaders were sent from bangladesh and nepal and even some of the countries which were not at all like that much accommodative of the belt and road initiative like us japan uk germany france etc even they sent some representatives to the belt and road forum in the case of south asia almost all of the south asian countries except india and bhutan participated in the belt and road initiative nepal earlier it was not ready to participate in the belt and road forum but anyway it also was attending the belt and road forum so except india and bhutan all the south asian countries were there and bhutan even now it doesn't even have formal diplomatic relations with china so anyway china chinese response was that it rejected any criticism against the belt and road forum it said that it, this was an open to all a win win cooperation it is only aimed at prosperity we will not be doing any kind of geopolitical game through the one belt one road project this is only aimed at economic cooperation that was what the chinese said anyway india what should we do about the one belt one road project India has often built many counter strategies to the one belt one road project and whereas some people say that we should be a part of the one belt one road project it is going to be one of the biggest changes that will be happening in the 21st century anyway in countering the one belt one road project india have launched a major initiative called project mosam and in 2015 mains upsc asked us a question about project mosam so let us have a look at project mosam see the countries in the indian ocean are basically tied by weather and monsoon winds like the word mausam in arabic is an arabic word it means weather or it refers to monsoon winds and this monsoon winds are like these winds are flowing in such a way that india is sort of like a geographical center to the indian ocean and due to this monsoon wind what happened due to this monsoon wind was see there will be a particular kind of monsoon and after that particular kind of monsoon travel becomes difficult so like this monsoon flows in this particular direction and people can easily travel during that monsoon in that particular direction after that they will be taking some rest and they will be staying in like countries like india and when the next monsoon comes they will be traveling back so this sort of an arrangement like uh, this sort of a geographical arrangement was there and due to this geographical like what we say geographical bonding there was a cultural bonding between the countries in the indian ocean region and now we now the what project mosam it aims to do is that it it is aiming to restore that cultural bonding that was there between india as well as countries of the indian ocean region so this is a project by the ministry of culture and archaeological society of india new delhi is the nodal agency of the project so countries around the indian ocean are bound together by monsoon winds and india now wants to revive ancient maritime trade routes between india and 
all these Indian Ocean countries and India wants to promote cultural linkages between countries in this region. So only after the One Belt One Road project India got this kind of an idea. Anyway now what India is trying to do is India is trying to list this project Mosam as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So India now wants, India is trying to get a World Heritage status by, from UNESCO to the project Mosam. But China being a veto powered member is blocking that and China is saying that this UNESCO World Heritage status should be provided for the maritime silk road. It was also there in history. See only one of these projects can get to that World Heritage status. Again there is again a India-China comp competition over the project Mosam. So anyway what can we do about the Belt and Road project? One argument is that we should have a counter to the One Belt One Road project and in the 21st century the main peculiarity of the 21st century is that security and economics go together. Means if you have good economic relations, you will be having good security relations. You cannot come like simply build military relations and these sort of things. So first we will be like need to, we need to improve our economic power in the Indian Ocean region. So for that what we can do is that we only have a limited set of resources. We does not have much economic power like China. China's economy is like five times larger than India. So by using our limited resources, we will be, we should invest on making some Indian Ocean network of ports in countries which are favor favorable to India or in countries which are allies of India. So that, that is what we are doing right now. We built the Chabahar port in Iran so that we can build a railway connection and other things and we can link it to Central Asia. Then we are making the Kaladan multimodal transport corridor in Myanmar so that we can connect India to the ASEAN countries. Then there was again another plan to set up a Mekong Ganga corridor by connecting India to the Mekong sub-region or MGC countries. Then there are so much such project and one huge geographical advantage that India have is the Andaman Nicobar Islands. See this Andaman Nicobar Islands it is located at the very center of Bay of Bengal and like we can even uh, completely negate almost all of the advantage China is getting through all these ports by using the Andaman Nicobar Islands. It is such a geographical asset or a strategic asset to India in dealing with the Belt and Road Initiative. Andaman Nicobar along with the Siachen Glacier is the most important, is one of the most important, strategically important territories of India. Like there is, even now there is a huge criticism that we haven't explored or we haven't made that kind of a military facility or naval facilities in Andaman Nicobar. We haven't used the Andaman Nicobar Islands up to its strategic importance. Then there was again a plan by India to build a port called Trincomali port in Sri Lanka, but uh, that is not uh, working out right now. Like uh, it seems India have sort of abandoned the plan to build the Trincomali port. Whereas there is another argument that we should not try to counter the Belt and Road Initiative. Instead or it is very difficult to counter the Belt and Road Initiative. Instead we should see it with an economic sense. The Belt and Road Initiative can be beneficial to India. That is the that is another argument which is again pushed by some of the security experts. And they say that China's massive economic growth and its excess industrial capacity is the reason why China is investing this much money and improving infrastructure, connecting it to all these countries so that it can use this excess industrial capacity and it can sell its products in all these countries. And rather than opposing it, like even if we oppose it, we can we cannot completely block it. So instead of opposing it, maybe we should be a part of it because we does not have that kind of resources to counter Belt and Road project. And we cannot like we cannot make up an alternative to the Belt and Road initiative. We does not have that kind of money to put a global connectivity infrastructure. And in the few like in the past when China started two global financial institutions, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and New Development Bank, India has been partners of both of these financial institutions. So both India and China, they want to change the global financial institutions. They want to have a multipolar world order. Like what this means is that, like currently there is only one superpower in the world. And that is the United States of America. Militarily, economically, it is the number one power in the world. What, in, what are the BRICS countries? Like basically the BRICS countries like Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, etc. What they aim to do is that they want to build a multi polar world order where there will be massive superpowers there will be many countries who will be sharing the superpower status and for that uh, 
the problem is the global financial mechanism it is mainly pegged in favor of the western countries or the united states so india and china they are explicitly committed towards revamping the international organization revamping the global financial structure through initiatives like asian infrastructure investment bank new development bank etc so maybe india should so that is one argument maybe like india joined the aib and ndb maybe india should be a part of the belt and road initiative also and another thing people often say is that see we are already building roads connecting chabahar to central asia and all so now then from central asia we can maybe use the belt and road infrastructure to connect or to trade with europe and other countries so that is again another argument that was proposed in favor of the belt and road initiative then uh, there is a senior research fellow in the institute of defense studies analysis or the idsa of india and uh, he was ambassador p stopdan he was a former ambassador of india to kyrgyzstan a central asian country anyway he proposed a concept of india china economic corridor or india china silk route corridor in order to counter china pakistan economic corridor what he proposed was that the china wants a connectivity to the indian ocean and you cannot blame china for that china is facing such a geographical vulnerability in the future maybe the us can blockade the malacca strait so you can you have to think from the chinese point of view also so china simply needs an access to the indian ocean and if we can provide that access or if we can provide an access for china to the indian ocean maybe we can solve the china pakistan economic corridor issue that was what ambassador p stopdan proposed he proposed an india china economic corridor basically this will be an economic corridor which will be starting from western china from there it will be connected from there there is an area in kashmir called the ladakh it's a buddhist majority area so from the western portion or xinjiang or kashgar in china from there the corridor will be going to ladakh from there it can connect to north india and from there it can be linked to any of the indian ports in the western coast like ports in gujarat or maharashtra that was his idea by having an india china economic corridor we can simply destroy china pakistan economic corridor that was his idea anyway this is again a really great uh, idea because like let us have a look at what will be the advantages of an india china economic corridor or a silk route corridor between india and china so china will be building the infrastructure because they really badly need an access to the indian ocean and this will be boosting the indian economy this will be generating employment etc and why are they building a pipeline because they need to get oil and natural gas transported through that pipeline so we can get money through the pipeline transit fees and another thing is that if china is putting this much money on india this can be a like this can be our card against china if they are attacking us also so there will not be any aggression between india and china in the future also if there is this much economic dependency so again that can be a positive thing and another thing is we need we can import uh, natural gas and oil and everything from russia but we doesn't have a geographical connection with russia so again we can build a pipeline connecting india china and russia see and the russians have often said that the russians had a plan called the primakov plan and what the primakov plan basically said that if india china and russia are standing united as allies no country in the world or no organization in the world can threaten these countries these three countries so it could be an initiative in building an india russia china cooperation also anyway it can we can counter cpec easily like why would china put so much money in terrorism play in the pakistan see china's own investment in cpec is a big risk even the chinese are afraid that they will be losing their money due to terror activities and other security threats in pakistan so they will be naturally preferring an india china economic corridor that will be a huge advantage and again by using that corridor we can physically connect with europe central asia etc see china again through china we can connect to central asia and another and why the india china economic corridor is better than china pakistan economic corridor is also there is another reason see you remember that first video right so Ch most of chinese economy is located on where the eastern side of china and uh, basically cpec goes from western part of china to pakistan see basically Ch but chinese growth centers are located on the eastern part of china if we could build an economic corridor connecting eastern part of china through arunachal pradesh or any of the northeastern state that might be even better for china 
because most of their economic development is happening on the eastern side. So that is again a major advantage to the India-China economic corridor. So maybe if you can't defeat them, maybe join them, that might be the better way. That was what Ambassador P. Stopdan said in talking about the Belt and Road Initiative. Anyway, there were two countries who were really angered by the Belt and Road Initiative. They were India and Japan. So they bought uh, something to counter Belt and Road Initiative and that is called Asia-Africa Growth Corridor. This is a very, very, this is a very, very important topic for our this year mains examination because this was just recently launched. So if you are writing about the One Belt, One Road Initiative, you must write about the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor. So this is an economic connectivity project that was launched by India and Japan to counter the One Belt, One Road project. So what uh, India and Japan aims to do here is to build a free and open Indo-Pacific region. So this is the key word here, to build a free and open Indo-Pacific region. So in the Belt and Road Initiative, it is threatening the national security of India. Similarly, China is threatening the security of the Southeast Asian countries in the South China Sea dispute and all. It is threatening Japan in East China Sea dispute and all. So what India and Japan said that uh, the economic corridor that we will be launching, it will not be threatening security of anybody. This will be a democratic form of arrangement. So that is what uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific term refers to. Then this is all about uh, re rediscovering ancient sea routes and creating new sea corridors. So this, there will not be any land corridors. This is basically about building sea corridors that will be connecting Asia to Africa. So South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia. Building sea corridors which connects all these countries to Africa. Because Africa has so much resources. And sea corridors have several advantages like they have very low cost and they have low carbon footprint when compared to land corridors like the economic belt as part of the One Belt One Road project. So we have like what we aims to really do is to connect ports. Like we will be creating sort of things like twin ports or connected ports. For example, uh, there is a port in Gujarat called Jamnagar port. This will be linked to Djibouti port in Africa. This That is sort of like a sea corridor. Then again, uh, ports of Mombasa and Zanzibar, these are ports in Africa in countries like, like uh, Kenya and uh, Tanzania. So these ports will be connected to Madurai port in India. Then again, Kolkata will be linked to Situe port. And there is this initiative of Indian government called the Sagaramala program, a port-led development or a more port-centered development, creating new ports and creating more infrastructure, connecting the ports to the rest of the country, etc. So Sagaramala program is this kind of an initiative and under the Sagaramala program, now we are building special ports in order to augment the Asia-Africa growth corridor or in order to create these kind of sea corridors connecting Asia and Africa. And uh, in addition to that, there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of other plans. There are plans to build institutional, industrial and transport infrastructure. So that you can connect all these newly built ports to railway stations and other kind of uh, like areas of importance. And these ports will be mainly, first you will be identifying growth ports in Asia and Africa. Means regions which are rapidly developing in Asia, Asia and Africa. These regions are called growth ports. It will be identified and in these growth ports, massive this kind of infrastructural projects will be made and this aims to make a globally competitive economic block between Asian and African countries. And Japan, Japan's contribution in the project will be state of the art technology and the ability to build quality infrastructure. Japan and China are the best countries in the world to build infrastructure. So Japan will be bringing its technology and infrastructure to the project and in the case of India, India has huge influence in Africa. Then again, for many of the African countries, India is their largest trading partners, trading partner. Then again, India has like this sort of geographical ties with Africa, so that that can be exploited in the case of such an Asia-Africa growth corridor. And before we end, again, I wanted to end with a quote also. When in 1989, when Rajiv Gandhi visited. China, the then Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping said to Rajiv Gandhi, an Asian century is only possible when India and China come together. 
See, so far, all the Asian countries were being oppressed by Western imperialists. Now, the 21st century, we need to build an Asian century, and that will only be possible if India and China come together, if they will have to radically alter their bilateral equation from areas of confrontation to areas of cooperation. That is what Deng Xiaoping said. Deng Xiaoping was, uh, is said to be the man who discovered China. See, like we often say Jawaharlal Nehru was the man who discovered India. He was the, he was one of the greatest leaders of India. Similarly, it was not Mao Zedong, it was Deng Xiaoping who made China to this kind of an economic power that we see today. See, China till 90, from the period of 1940s to 1980s, China and India had uh, similar economies. Like they even, even India, Indian economy was actually better than the Chinese economy. Because China was overpopulated and all this problem was there. But uh, in 1978, the Chinese Communist Party got a new party chief, Deng Xiaoping. And he really like uh, completely changed the Chinese economy. He started a more like trade based economy and all. And Deng Xiaoping was the man who made China this kind of an economic powerhouse today that we see today and Xiaoping really believed that India and China will have to be cooperating if we need to build an Asian century. And for that, uh, like this is a picture of a girl holding an Indian flag on the India-China border in Arunachal Pradesh. And there it is written that India-China friendship for a bright and glorious future. And if we have to build that bright and glorious future, we will have to improve our economic cooperation and our willingness to engage between India and China should be there and we should have to strengthen the trust between India and China. That will be our only way of solving this huge boundary dispute. And that will be our, that should be our strategy towards Pakistan also. And uh, like we said that Nehru had a policy towards China that was called Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai. But Narendra Modi uh, made another statement, he has his own statement, inch towards smiles. That was the statement Narendra Modi made towards India-China friendship when he visited China in 2014. So what Narendra Modi said was, see, this statement refers to inch means India and China towards miles or, or India and China should have a millennium of exceptional synergy. That is what Narendra Modi said about India-China cooperation. And what he said, to quote his own words, he said that when India and China gain 35% of the global population benefits. And every inch we can make, we can cover, we can rewrite the history of humanity. See, that is what, ha what is happening in the case of climate change right now. The global, in the fight of global climate change, things have like radically changed because India and China are now the leaders of mitigating global climate change issues.